Aloha, welcome to Global Connections. I'm your host, Grace Chang, and I'm joined here today by Pamela Rotner Sakamoto, author of Midnight and Broad Daylight, a Japanese American family get, what is it, caught between two worlds. So we're, today we're going to be talking about reflecting on identity and exclusion, past and present. So I welcome Pamela to the program. Hi, Pam, nice to see you here on the program today. Oh, thank you, Grace, for having me to Global Connections. Thank you very much for coming. Um, yeah, you, you have like a, a, a book that has come out in, in hardcover early last year and paperback earlier this year, Midnight and Broad Daylight, and it's received quite a lot of acclaim. Um, really interesting, really interesting story about a Japanese American family during World War II and their you know, some of the family members are in Japan, some stay in the United States and their experiences. So um, what led you uh, to this, this uh, study and, and, you know, the background that, that you have that brought you to this project? Oh, thank you. So I was living in Tokyo, and this is, goes back to 1994, and I was working on my dissertation, which was on a totally different topic, mm -hmm. a diplomatic history topic, and I happened to meet the protagonist of Midnight in Broad Daylight, a gentleman named Harry Fukuhara, mm -hmm. by chance. And he was a retired U.S. Army colonel who was in Tokyo as a favor to a friend, and he was escorting a group of uh, former Jewish refugees who had survived the Holocaust thanks to um, transit visas from a Japanese diplomat. It was oh, a very wow. unusual yeah. historical episode of, mm -hmm. of rescue, and that's what I was working on. Mm -hmm. And I was at this press conference, and I saw this gentleman uh, who was navigating the crowd of, of former refugees who were returning to Japan, which mm -hmm. uh, they had traveled to in 1940 and 1941 for the first time mm -hmm. since that time. And they were overwhelmed uh, by emotions. And he was uh, making them feel at home. And then he was talking with Japanese diplomats who were there to recognize the heroic um, actions of one of their own. But it was a complicated story behind mm -hmm. the scenes. And he was uh, being received very respectfully by them. And he was talking to the diplomat, uh, the press corps from both the United States and Japan. He seemed to handle everybody with equal aplomb in mm -hmm. both um, Japanese and English. Oh, wow. And I was startled um, by his capability in Japanese mm -hmm. and his his poise and his and everything was native, native English and native Japanese. Wow. Uh -huh. And it was subsequently because of this meeting that I heard that he had a remarkable uh, story of his own. Mm -hmm. And that was the original encounter. Oh, yeah, that's so interesting. And so this story is, can you tell us a bit more about the story of the, uh, of the family's experience itself? So the gentleman I met, um, Harry, he was born and raised outside of Seattle mm -hmm. uh, by Japanese immigrant parents from mm -hmm. Hiroshima. Uh, his parents had five children. All children were U.S. born citizens mm -hmm. and uh, were making their way as Americans uh, in, on the West Coast. Their father died in, at the mm -hmm. height of the Great Depression, and their mother took all five children back to her native Hiroshima because she couldn't really afford to stay in the U.S., and there was so much anti-Japanese discrimination mm -hmm. in the U.S. that it, would, it was hard for her children to stay as well. Mm -hmm. But two of those children, after spending several years in Japan, insisted on returning to the United States, mm -hmm. which they viewed as their rightful home. Mm -hmm. uh, one daughter named Mary and Harry, the middle mm -hmm. son. Uh, so they returned in 1938, and they ended up being caught on the West Coast uh, after Pearl Harbor yeah. uh, when 120,000 people of um, Japanese ancestry mm -hmm. were interned mm -hmm. and or really incarcerated. Interned mm -hmm. is really a euphemism yes. for being imprisoned. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, they were two of those. And Harry volunteered for the U.S. Army because of his bilingual ability out of an internment camp in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And he was sent to the Southwest Pacific as a linguist, as a uh, translator and uh, interrogator of mm -hmm. POWs. And while he was island hopping, mm -hmm. his brothers who had stayed in Japan were inducted into the Japanese army. Mm -hmm. And they were perhaps 
going to be in the same place at the same yeah, time. Yeah, on the opposite sides. Yes. That's kind of crazy. Yeah. And the only yeah. uh, event that intervened was the uh, detonation of the atomic bombs. Wow, on their home, family hometown, Hiroshima. Yes. Wow, that's really compelling. So, I mean, that the history itself is so is really important to know. But I think the way you tell it through the families' experiences is particularly compelling, especially about how yeah their identities were you know being uh, challenged because we have these you know this this. Uh, conflict between the U.S. Where, where certain people of certain ancestries were not seeing as belonging and, and you know, a, a very strong nationalism erupting in Japan, which probably made some of the, the American-born Japanese looked at with suspicion a bit, huh? Oh, so, so true. So mm -hmm. no matter where they were, they were betwixt and between. Mm -hmm. So uh, growing up in the U.S., they weren't really aware when they were young, mm -hmm. uh, except it was subtle, like Harry wouldn't be invited to certain friends' mm -hmm. houses. Mm -hmm. he, he knew instinctively that he couldn't date a uh, white girl, mm -hmm. even though he wanted to. Uh, they all knew that uh, job opportunities were limited mm -hmm. for Japanese Americans, mm -hmm. no matter how outstanding they were in school. Uh, and so there was this difficulty, but yet this can-do Americanism mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And But uh, it all changes after uh, Pearl Harbor. Yes. Yeah. And then though, for those family members who were in Japan, and even for Harry during the years that he was in Japan before he went uh, back to the U.S., there was really uh, overt mm -hmm. anti-Americanism. And mm -hmm. although they looked Japanese, this family, mm -hmm. they had been raised in the U.S., the children, and they were American. Mm -hmm. They acted much more American than Japanese. And even though mm -hmm. they had Japanese language skills, they didn't move like the Japanese, yes. they didn't mm -hmm. think like the Japanese, and uh, particularly Harry's youngest brother, Frank, he entered an elite middle school based mm -hmm. on his academic ability, but then he was mercilessly bullied, oh, wow. and he suspected, and other people really corroborated, yeah. that it was because of his American background. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is interesting, because there's this insistence on purity on one side, right, and then this kind of very racial exclusion on the other. Um, yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I can't imagine that's a really, yeah, difficult history. Not that it's that far away from uh, some of us, right? In the 60s if you, and 70s even, we still experienced a bit of that. I think recent, you know, in recent decades, we've kind of, I feel, I mean, I was born in the late 60s and then, you know, coming, coming the last few decades, I feel that things had improved. But nowadays, I think, you know, race has come back into the forefront. And um, recently you were invited to the, the Tucson Festival of Books, and you were invited to speak on a series of panels on, on race in the United States and the Japanese-American internment in the U.S. and the Holocaust, which is an interesting combination of topics. Um, I mean, do you think that the, these historical instances, the Japanese-American internment, the Holocaust, are these, are these relevant to our discussions about race in the U.S. today? They are. I mean, uh, one of the reasons that uh, the Tucson Festival of Books was focusing on these themes was because it's an anniversary year, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, they wanted to recognize the USS Arizona, um, mm -hmm. and the festival was held at the University of Arizona. But uh, And then there were all these new books coming out about the internment and about uh, the Holocaust. And so mm -hmm. uh, it was that kind of occasion, but absolutely resonant, and uh, the panels were were over enrolled. They had to live stream really? outside wow. oh, um, in the commons, uh -huh. and and uh, so there's tremendous interest, which is a good thing because mm -hmm. um, I believe that education is the key. And if we're open mm -hmm. uh, to learning the history and discussing it and uh, furthering our education, then as a society, we're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. It's when mm -hmm. we shut down and fall into that sort of nationalism right. uh, spirit and. Uh, which is excessive patriotism and ultranationalism, and uh, when we classify others as the other mm -hmm. and uh, seek to create differences uh, mm -hmm. and fall back on stereotypes that were in danger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that that's that's great to hear that there was such an audience and interest in speaking about this and learning about the history. Um, the history itself, were people very making that connection, you think, um, with the history that you, you've worked on. And, and you worked on uh, 
the Jewish refugees during World War II, so something linked to the, I mean, the period of the Holocaust. Uh, this is something that, that, do you think that the audience kind of understood that connection? I think so. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, to some degree, an audience is self-selecting, right? Mm -hmm. They choose yeah. the panels to which um, they want to go, but uh, definitely, I mean, they were there asking questions about what is happening now, what, mm -hmm. uh, what stages are we at, what should we be doing, mm -hmm. uh, because we are living probably in historic times, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at least, at the very least, exciting times and yeah. volatile times. Uh, and I think one of the messages is that we do have to look to history. I don't believe that history repeats itself. Mm -hmm. but I believe that there are uh, distinct patterns, mm -hmm. and if we can uh, remind ourselves of those patterns, then it's possible to bypass some of the uh, dangers. And certainly the internment was a huge error mm -hmm. on the American government's part. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a stain on the Constitution. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the legality still stands, and that's why it's scary. Oh, really? Is that the law uh -huh. is, is on that the, right? the books. What, um, what law are you well, speaking of? Well, yeah. um, the Executive Order 9066 that uh -huh. President Roosevelt signed that mm -hmm. authorized the internment Mm -hmm. has um, never really been overturned. Really? It was challenged uh -huh. um, by Fred Korematsu um, in Korematsu versus the United States. Uh, and the uh, problems of the internment were recognized and the injustice um, perpetrated against this mm -hmm. Japanese American gentleman who was arrested for mm -hmm. uh, resisting the internment was recognized. But the, the law itself has not been deemed unconstitutional. Really? Uh, so uh -huh. it's frightening because... Uh, that is it, frightening. It, the law is in place, and mm -hmm. hopefully it will mm -hmm. not be used as a precedent. Right, right. Uh, but we've heard that kind of language during the presidential election in which uh, a supporter uh, and somebody who worked on the Trump campaign had mm -hmm. bandied about the internment as a plausible uh, solution to uh -huh. uh, a perceived Muslim threat, oh. and uh, so we have to make sure that mm -hmm. we do believe that this law cannot mm -hmm. be employed and that these kinds of executive orders uh, really damage our society mm -hmm. and uh, that the internment was found to be totally unnecessary. Mm -hmm. uh, not a single Japanese American was ever prosecuted and found guilty of um, treason or espionage yeah. out of that 120,000. A really two, significant number of families. And mm -hmm. two thirds were Japanese, were, excuse me, two thirds were American citizens by birth. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. of Japanese descent, but born in the USA well, with citizens. Wow. And the uh -huh. remainder who were Japanese immigrants to the U.S., I mean, they were hardworking, mm -hmm. um, contributing legal immigrants mm -hmm. uh, whose world was uh, overturned virtually overnight. Yeah, right. I mean, and in the process, right, they lost their whatever professional uh, lives, their their property in many many cases. So there was a lasting lasting effect to that. But I'm still startled about this um, executive order. The basis of it hasn't been overturned, and it being brought up during the campaign. I wasn't. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that. That there was a there's a legal basis for saying internment is a potential solution. I don't like that word no, either. <laughs> no, I don't either. And, no, and that gives me chills. I mean, you no. Know, I mean, both of us. I mean, what the words that come to mind? But yes, uh, yeah. no. And uh, well, uh, Justice, uh, the late Justice uh, Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia mm -hmm. came to the Richardson School of Law. Uh, at UH Manoa and uh, several years ago and mm -hmm. he was asked about mm -hmm. uh, internment whether that kind of episode would ever occur again and it's interesting because it was at a quiet time mm -hmm. it was post 9-11 but it wasn't mm -hmm. during the election or even close to the election yeah. and yet he responded um, in in times of war, the laws mm -hmm. go silent in Latin, wow. and uh, it could be in times of crisis. It doesn't have to be war. Mm -hmm. It can be in, in times of a scare. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, 
so he, he was explaining to everybody in a non-political way mm -hmm. that uh, when we perceive a national security threat, mm -hmm. uh, that's when these kinds of things happen, mm -hmm. and it is plausible. Wow. And yeah. I hope uh -huh. it's not probable. Right. Uh, that it merely remains possible. Yeah, something to be uh, vigilant about. Yes, yeah, and I think vigilance you. is the best uh -huh. word. It, you know, <laughs> if, as, a, as citizens, if we can watch and uh, read closely and be active mm -hmm. uh, and protest when we mm -hmm. see injustice. I mean, we're talking at heart with the Holocaust and the internment about social injustice. Right, serious forms. Well, yes. thank you, Pam. Okay, we'll come back in a minute. Um, so you're watching Global Connections and I'm here with Pam Sakamoto talking about reflecting on identity and exclusion. We'll be back in one minute. Aloha, this is your host Beatrice Cantelmo. Uh, come and join us every Friday at 4 o'clock uh, on Perspectives of Global Justice. Are you looking to get shrunk? Join us on Shrink Wrap Hawaii. My name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. I see couples, individuals, families, because you know why? Because we all have problems. And if you're curious about shrinks and what they talk about, come look at my show, Shrink Wrap Hawaii, and maybe you'll find your shrink. Hi, this is uh, Jane Sugimura. I'm the co-host for Condo Insider, and we're on Think Tech Hawaii every Thursday at 3 o'clock. And we're here to talk about uh, condominium living and uh, issues that affect condominium residents and owners. And I hope you'll join us every week on Thursday. Aloha. Aloha, welcome back to Global Connections. I'm your host, Grace Chang, joined here by Pam Sakamoto, author of Midnight and Broad Daylight. And we're talking about reflecting on identity and exclusion, past and present. So Pam, welcome back from the break. We've been talking about identity and exclusion in history, particularly in the US during World War II, but also a bit about the Holocaust. I mean, these are extreme examples of, of exclusion, uh, up to their physical exclusion to, in the Japanese American case, the internment camps, the concentration camps, not Holocaust centers right. uh, yeah, in, in, in Europe. Um, but, but, you know, like we were saying, we, we you know, uh, uh, Justice Scalia's uh, wise words, you know, that, that we warn us to be vigilant about, about any development towards, towards these kinds of extreme actions. But, but, you know, leading up to those events in history or those, you know, I don't know how to say it, uh, not events is too, too light, but, but, you know, there were more subtle kinds of, of uh, policies and, and uh, tone in, in, in the community building up. Um, are, are there any parallels that we can see as far as that, that history? So both with the internment and the Holocaust, I mean, the, the soil was seeded for decades uh, in the case of the internment and for hundreds and hundreds of years in the case mm -hmm. of the Holocaust. Uh, yeah. So none of these episodes happen uh, spontaneously mm -hmm. um, out of the blue, and there's a degree of planning as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, with the present day parallels, um, well, I would look back at the internment and look at the um, anti-Japanese uh, sentiment that was so widespread in the press on the West Coast, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that slowly turned uh, the populace against uh, the Japanese American community. Mm -hmm. And that dated really from the late 1800s um, on. Uh, as soon as the Chinese started immigrating to the United States, it, and they were invited to work on the railroads, mm -hmm. and they were followed by the Japanese for the same reason. But as soon as they were perceived as posing an economic threat mm -hmm. to white laborers, mm -hmm. um, anti-Asian sentiment flared. Mm -hmm. And even though it would quiet during um, periods of prosperity, it was always there. Mm -hmm. And then legislation was there mm -hmm. on the state and federal books. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of now, I mean, we see that kind of anti-Muslim sentiment mm -hmm. um, in the press, a certain press. Uh, and uh, 
we, we see stereotypes being used, we see people jumping to conclusions, mm -hmm. and it does slowly poison the air or make it mm -hmm. um, more toxic. And uh, certainly with the Muslim ban, it's now being challenged in the courts. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen two versions of it, um, but this is legislation. Mm -hmm. And whether the court decisions will hold, and I hope that they do, and certainly the state of Hawaii is uh, taking a leading role with our yes. Attorney General's actions, mm -hmm. uh, then if the, uh, the court holds, uh, that is a very good thing. Mm -hmm. It's when I think the court falls into line with the prevailing prejudice um, in a larger society that a society's uh, stability and the minority uh, at mm -hmm. risk are truly in danger. And that's mm -hmm. what we saw with the Holocaust, with all of the Nuremberg laws passed mm -hmm. in 1935, long before the Holocaust itself, mm -hmm. in terms of genocide, in terms of the deliberate mm -hmm. extermination of a people, long before that was put into motion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, with the uh, immigration, or even it, like initially at least, now it's being challenged, but yeah, families were, were separated because some families couldn't, some members of the family couldn't arrive return to the U.S. and um, with the more also I think this is something that strikes me you know we, we hear a lot about um, yeah families being separated because there's a more rigorous uh, effort to deport people you know as far as you know uh, people who are not top priority I guess right like we, we used to have uh, we, we had the standard about because you know these issues about about uh, allowing allowing Im immigrants to stay in the country and now there's a a uh, more rigorous effort to do that. So I kind of see that, yeah, that parallel with, we don't have that phys actual physical detention of, of persons, which I hope we never get to. But definitely there's a beginning physical separation of families that are, that's a little bit troubling. I actually would like to know more about the, de the temporary detentions that have mm -hmm. taken place where people have been um, held at the airport or then removed mm -hmm. from the airport and taken mm -hmm. places because the little that I've seen in the press, and I'm reading the same articles as as many of us, is that the conditions um, and the treatment is, is quite, the conditions are harsh and the treatment is quite cold and mm -hmm. um, frightening. So, uh, you know, I just, it's a slippery slope. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got to make sure that we don't use euphemisms for um, any part of this process, I mean, during the internment, we called uh, these county fairgrounds, that, which were re mm -hmm. repurposed as prisons, we called them assembly centers. Oh, wow. Uh, and people were living in horse stalls. Oh, wow. And then uh -huh. we called uh, the internment camps camps. Mm -hmm. like, you're just mm -hmm. going to camp for the summertime. Yeah. But yeah. these were prisons with barbed wire, with uh, watchtowers, with the guns facing in. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we, we have to uh, really watch our language and watch our actions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very, yeah, that's a very important thing to keep in mind, right? So, I mean, what is different about today, you think, uh, United States in 2017 versus back in the, in the 30s and 40s? Well, that's what keeps me optimistic, mm -hmm. um, because there are families like this family in which uh, Harry, the middle son, was interned, serves in the U.S. Army, mm -hmm. uh, ends up having a 50-year career in the U.S. Army, retires as one of the of the first Japanese American colonels is highly lauded. The 500th Military Intelligence Brigade, uh, which covers intelligence for the Pacific, and it's at Schofield Barracks. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, that headquarters is named after him, oh, wow. which okay. is uh, yeah. so amazing because yeah. he was a gardener on the day of of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, and wow. uh, and look how he made a life of service. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that um, Schofield Barracks area was strafed by Japanese zeros en route to Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. So there are these remarkable stories of people who have overcome obstacles and mm -hmm. uh, contributed, and they've only made our country stronger, mm -hmm. and they're in our midst. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I also think that we uh, have an educational system now that is not militaristic. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan had a militaristic system. Mm. Uh, Germany, of course, did. Yes. And that um, suppresses free thought. And true, so we, we mm -hmm. stress critical inquiry now mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in our 
public and private educational system, and, and that's healthy. Uh, yeah. So education, um, the dissemination of information. Uh, we have social media. It's, mm -hmm. it, it's a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, if something happens, such as the airline event recently, oh, yes, uh, right. mm -hmm. everybody sees it. Mm -hmm. And everybody has a voice. Mm -hmm. And pop, public opinion can truly make a difference in a very rapid manner now. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that uh, our government, uh, at heart, uh, people knows that our va what our values are and yeah. I'm talking the entire yeah. government right as a whole mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, we we have to hold these values dear so uh, yeah I do hope um, with vigilance mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that we're in a much better place yeah uh, but since situations can uh, sort of move out of control quickly mm -hmm. that's why we have to stay on top of everything yeah yeah always important to to remain aware and and respond uh, in a way to, to reverse any any kind of movement in that direction. And yeah, it's, this is, yeah, at, we are well after the civil rights era, whereas d during World War II, right, the civil rights hadn't even, even uh, been a, a large movement as it was in the 60s. And then, um, yeah, I think we are generally more aware and try to, to give voice to all different peoples and listen. So that's a positive, a positive thing. Right. I mean, well, there's a backlash we, in our society right now, mm -hmm. but um, we are becoming ever more diverse. And mm -hmm. by the time the next census takes place, uh, we will have a society in which uh, the minorities are the majority, many minorities, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe we'll look more like Hawaii, mm -hmm. uh, where we really can serve as a role model for the rest of the nation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Pam, and, and you know, not only for this book, which you put so much work and, and this beautiful writing into, but you know, to continue to, to, to participate in these public events, to, to bring these issues out in the fore, and that we, you know, we explore our history uh, as we talk about the present day. So thanks for joining oh, me today. Thank you, Grace. My pleasure. Okay. And thank you all for joining us on Global Connections. I'm your host, Grace Cheng, finishing up here with Pam Sakamoto the author of Midnight and Broad Daylight, and we'll see you here next Thursday at 1 p.m. Aloha.